Well, thank you everyone for uh, joining the webinar this morning, uh, this afternoon, wherever you may be. Uh, my name is Ken Lee. I'm the Vice President of Worldwide Marketing at Suma Software. It's my pleasure to have you all on this call. Um, Suma Software is a cloud-based provider of IT management applications and solutions. Uh, we're based in Fremont, California in the United States. And uh, we're focused on providing the most comprehensive, cost-effective IT management solutions uh, in the marketplace. Um, it's my pleasure to have uh, Evelyn Ehrlich from uh, Forrester Research um, uh, join me today and uh, talk about a wonderful presentation in terms of what businesses need to do to better optimize their IT operations. Uh, so with that, let me uh, pass it on to Evelyn. Great. Thank you, Ken, and I hope uh, you all can hear me, and um, thank you for all your time today to go through uh, a few slides. Hopefully, um, we will gain a lot of details from it. I want to encourage you to ask questions in the chat window during the presentation or afterwards. We'll try to get to the questions uh, as much as possible. So let's get started on the first uh, topic, of course, optimizing IT operations. Um, the topic of today with regards to optimizing IT operations is one of the topics which is very much um, a very important topic I have with my clients inside uh, Force for Research. One of my focus area is IT management and in the IT management um, we are very much uh, talking to clients large and small with regards to what um, can be done in terms of their optimization of the IT organization. So let me go to the next slide here. And uh, for some reason, I can't move my slides. I'm not sure why. Um, but it's just, uh, hopefully, it's just something going on here on my end. So sorry about that. Um, to quickly do an agenda review. I can't see the slides yet, and I can't do any. I can't really do any moving, uh, moving of the slides for some reason. Okay. All right, good. We're good now. So today's theme: transforming IT operations by optimizing value. Is much of what our clients in force to say, and I do know from some of uh, their clients have the same challenges. Um, what I wanted to talk through today is a variety of things. First of all, what are some of the priorities of IT? What about efficiencies and the moves? I will introduce you to a animal. Then the beef of the presentation will be around possible steps for optimization. Um, we'll talk a little bit about people, process, and tools, and then hopefully with a conclusion and uh, some possible questions. Now, before we get into the details of the presentation, I wanted to ask you some questions, and I think Ken is going to do a poll. But really important for us is to understand where does your pain lie today? Are you challenged with significant cost pressure? Is your pain to be more efficient in your organization? Do you have the lack of skills in your team? Don't you, you might... Uh, miss a variety of folks, not just resources, but the right, uh, the right knowledge. Your pain might be lying in that you don't have a strategy for IT management, um, or you might not have the right tools, or maybe there are some other challenges you have with regards to that. So we are actually uh, wanting to know um, where you lie in these, uh, in, these, in these areas so that we can get a feeling for that. Ken, can you turn on the poll? Okay, great. So if you, everybody can take a look at that poll and uh, click on uh, the option that is most appropriate uh, for you, and I'll leave the poll open for about uh, 30 seconds or so. And while you're doing that poll, again, what we're trying to understand really is what is the key pain, the things you have experienced the most. In Many times you probably will want to say yes to all of them, but which is the one with the burning platform that's really what we're interested in. So let's give it a couple more seconds, and then we can 
see what everybody is saying. All right, we're good, Ken. Okay, great. Well, that was great. We had that 75% of you uh, vote on this. Uh, that's great. And um, the breakout is that you know, a little over 50% of you said that uh, the cost pressures uh, were most significant. 53% uh, of you said that uh, need to be more efficient. And then the, the third, 27% of you said uh, we lack the right skills. 20% uh, of you said that we don't have a strategy, and 23 you said that we don't have the right tools. Wow, that is, that is actually great and uh, fits very well into the next slide. I was hoping um, for that distribution, uh, particularly the distribution of the cost pressure and the uh, being more uh, efficient. Um, we are finding the same from our um, clients, as you can see in this next slide. When we asked in 2011, um, this was uh, October 2011. What are the top five IT management priorities? You can see here the IT decision makers and others were saying that 73% said that they need to improve the efficiency of IT. 71% said they need to increase the IT capacity or the resources to drive business innovation, which we'll get to in a minute. That's important as well. And then streamlining business process, customer management capabilities, and lowering IT costs to free up money for new initiatives. So you all on the phone are very much in sync with regards to the top five IT management priorities we hear from our customers. Having said that, I want to bring up an, a, an example here which is quite interesting, completely away from IT, but something I found um, a way a, a a couple years ago, done by the Ford Fusion hybrid team. Um, many of you are probably familiar with Ford, of course. You might also be uh, in the know of, of the whole hybrid activity. But the Ford Fusion hybrid team put a contest together, and it was in Washington, D.C., where they started to look at efficiency. And they realized that efficiency was a combination of people, process and technology. Now, in this Ford Fusion hybrid competition, they had multiple teams driving this Ford car, and interesting what they found was their efficiency of miles per gallon or kilometers uh, per liter went up, actually doubled when the following things happened. First, the right people were used in this particular uh, driving session or section. One team actually had a, a NASCAR driver be the driver um, using a variety of different processes, such as hypermile name, which is a way to drive a hybrid car. Another process is to turn the heat off when it's not needed, turn the AC off when it's not needed, do a good or a bit more forward-looking braking when you get to the red car, uh, the red stoplight or the stoplight. Um, and then, of course, the technology, which was the Ford hybrid car. So again, the, the finding for Ford was which team was leveraging the efficiency of the fuel, and the best team actually doubled uh, in terms of the miles per gallon um, with regards to the, uh, the usage of, 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 the, of the gas. And, and the point here is really combination of people, process, technology is really how efficiency is being driven. Now, this many times, I use this example when I consult with IT organizations and I also with vendors to help them gear their tools into uh, the usage and the support of efficiency. Now, why am I using this example? Because all of us drive cars every day and all of us sometimes think about how can we translate, not sometimes, but really how can we translate people plus technology uh, in our own organization to become much more efficient. Now, with efficiency comes also the budget, because we do need the budget for spending. And here is some details with regards to the budget details around the small to medium businesses versus the enterprise spend. And you can see there is a difference between the small to medium, of course, in terms of IT operations and capital budget versus the um, enterprise. But interestingly, the IT spend per employee in US dollars, this is, 
isn't that much of a difference if you calculate it back down uh, to the IT spend per employee. And then last but not least, the IT operational or capital budget as a percentage of revenue also is not that different between SMB and enterprise. So even if we have a lot more money to start out with, if we translate that into the spend per employee and the percentage of revenue, even so, there's two different sizes of organizations, it is very interesting to see how similar this becomes, and this is very important. Now, many times, there's a lot of other details behind that, and we'll get to that in the presentation. Hi, Evelyn. Uh, just a quick uh, request, if you don't mind. Your sound uh, a bit distant, so I don't know if there's a way to get uh, closer to the microphone. Um, maybe I can... Not really, because the microphone is right here, but maybe what I should do is switch to the headset <coughs> instead of using the microphone. So oh, that sounds a lot better. Yeah, Thanks. Does that sound better? Much better. Thanks. All right. Great. Thank you. So as I was promising, you, uh, I wanted to introduce you to an animal called the MOVE. The MOVE stands for maintaining the, or the maintenance of ongoing operations, systems, and equipment. And what that is, is really the amount of dollars we spend with regards to the maintenance of all of our systems and all of our applications and everything running the business. Here you can see uh, on the left-hand side, the, in the small to medium business, about 72% um, of the budget is going to the MOOCs, the maintaining of the ongoing system environment. In enterprise, it's about 70%. And only 29% on the SMB and in the, in the enterprise, only 30% of the dollars is initiated and is uh, spent on innovation. That is unfortunately not good enough. So that means that much of our ongoing operations and maintenance work needs to be reduced to such a way that we can put much more of the dollars into innovation of our processes and futures, um, which means we really need to start thinking about how to optimize our organization's IT operations in much better ways to leverage much more out of our moves um, and shift, and as I call it, uh, reducing the moves, shifting that move to a much lower percentage. Let me give you an example of a financial service hub that who did that. So that challenge was they had soaring help desk costs and an evolving workforce requirement. Their solution was to have some kind of an efficiency initiative. They drove efficiency to cut costs while preparing for newer devices and support scenarios. They created subgroups which were particularly trained employees which helped to support a particular platform and they created cross teams to support new devices. As you know, many new iPads or uh, new devices, mobile devices are coming in. This organization really started to change how they organize and staff the people. On the process side, they, just, they created some dedicated support for business critical employee techniques, such as maybe the CAD CAM team of a car manufacturer or the frontline office, um, the ATM support or whatever it is. These dedicated support teams were focusing only on business critical and was immediately solving the problems which were business critical. And then on the technology end, they started to centralize the knowledge base, which they actually leveraged some kind of a social platform to share solutions, to improve self-service, which cut down a tremendous amount of the call, which means that the service sets could focus on much more high priority uh, things than questions uh, or things which are kind of mundane tasks during the day. So this is a good example of an organization who really started to take efficiency and spread it into three areas of people, process, and technology. Now, with this example, I want to talk you through eight steps how you can optimize IT operations. Now, you don't have to do all of those eight steps. You might just want to focus on two or three, or you might just want to go back and see where and what is possible for you. Um, and depending on, again, where your pain is, as 50% said it's cost pressure um, and 52% said it's efficiency and about 32% said lack in skills 
again, based on your pain, you might want to take a, a one or many of those items. So let's start in looking by at the first one, focus on service support. The first thing which is really important is that you understand what is needed by your client. Um, what type of service levels are important? Now, it doesn't matter if it is in a small to medium um, or in a mid-size or in a large enterprise. Understanding how at what level do you support your lines of business is important. With that understanding, you also need to have a good understanding of what does it cost to do that. Because not every priority can have, not everything can be a high priority. And this is where you really need to start thinking about where and what I do need to do first, and where can I start maybe enabling or pausing certain things, or don't do certain things anymore, because they're just not as high priority. The second important point is increased emphasis on customer experience. All of us should be and have the focus on, and should have focus on customer experience. Now, our customer experience in IT, of course, is different and sometimes also related to the customer experience of the overall company. So we need to make sure we understand that value chain. But for us in IT operations, in, in the IT organization, the focus on customer experience means that it needs to be much more pleasurable to do business with us and to work with us than a pain it used to be in the past. And that's really many times what I hear from my clients is my IT organization, they're just the organization of no. I'd rather go somewhere else. So many organizations are starting to implement a service catalog, a simple service catalog which shows your customers where and what you do and what you can do. With it, potentially, at what services you can do that. Is it a 24 by 7? Is the help desk avail available from 8 to 5? In what geographic region? Is it the East Coast, the West Coast? All of those things can be captured in a service catalog. Second, with that service catalog, as you start seeing things coming in, you might be able to introduce some self-service initiatives, such as maybe the resetting of a password or certain frequently asked questions, or the ordering of the software, or the ordering of the hardware component. All of those things could be self-service initiatives. As you are starting a service catalog initiative, you can harvest this with these requests and these data items, then you can actually start automating some of that to make it much, much easier for you to focus on some of the more important organizational items and requests and projects which are needed. Third, mobility. The management of mobile devices and the, manage, the managing of mobile devices and your staff to manage mobility is another one of those things. Now, in many organizations, no matter if large or small, we have all of our folks work at different sites. At Forrester, myself, for example, I'm a home office worker. My home office is in Colorado. My headquarter company is in Cambridge, uh, Boston, Cambridge and um, much of the work I do there. But we also have many times folks at client sites. I'm usually in transit. I sometimes am a satellite office somewhere over in Europe or in Asia. How to manage that is important. And understanding how your IT organization can support this mobile organization is important as well. But at the same time, I teach people need to have mobility on their own, uh, in their own groups as well. Meaning if I'm a service desk, a support person, or if I'm an operations manager and I'm in a staff meeting, maybe I'm in a, on a campus, on a university, I'm in a different big place, I need to make sure that I see my incidents and I need, need to see my problem where I'm at. So important to understand how can we support mobility and how can we ourselves in IT start becoming mobile to support our constituencies across the different areas, businesses, etc., etc. A fourth point is the usability factor. Now this one is sometimes easy to overlook. Um, I hear many times from my clients, again as I said, my IT organization is not easy to do business with. Everything it goes into a black hole and it never comes out. Much of that has to do with potentially having the right skills. Maybe have people who have business relationship skills. Um, at the same time, many times it has to do with the tools. I have seen spreadsheets with multiple tools 
which are used inside IT. And sometimes they're still not really figuring out what is going on operationally right now, because a lot of work is whistle chair correlation, as they call that, meaning somebody needs to correlate something from one tool to the next. This is really where IT management tools, which are end-to-end, -end, is starting to come to the market, which look end-to-end, -end, are helping quite a tremendous amount. Now, communication methods are changing as well. When I say ease of use doing business with you, this is from our Unified Communication Survey, but it really is showing us a great deal of changes. Still, many companies are saying they want telephone support, stick to your agent, you can see on the top. There are companies who are starting to do frequently asked questions. Um, they are sending email to customer service. Now, again, this is from, from Unified Communication, it's external or internal, but at the service desk, it's very similar. Um, what we're seeing is many more organizations are starting to adopt the virtual agents, starting to do online forums, starting to do the SMS, sending mobile messages, or using company social networks such as Twitter to help. Um, social crowding or crowdsourcing, helping out uh, with each other is happening as well. And again, no matter if you're large or small, these are potential ways in how you can make it much easier to help and manage the support of the people you need to help on a daily basis. As many of you, 32% of you said that there is some challenges around skills, I wanted to touch a little bit on change in role and functions I see. Now, some customers like you calling, you receiving a call from your customers, being the finance group or the marketing team or the sales team, or even the VIPs and so on, you will potentially get this sense of your, your customers or your constituency being very, very frustrated. But at the other end, the service desk agent or the command center operator or the subject matter expert is also, can also be very, very frustrated. And I think what is happening right now, what we're seeing is there is much, much more shift toward or an emphasis towards putting the right people in the right role. Now, if you're a mid-sized organization, your staff isn't that great size-wise, so you don't have the leisure of having a, 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 a 200 people IT organization. Maybe you do, but really looking at skills and the the knowledge of what these people have and want to do is key. Because not everybody wants to be in IT support, and not everybody can be a subject matter expert. Some of the roles we're seeing are business relationship managers, marketing managers, operation managers, operation analysts, service desk support specialists. Um, and what we're seeing in that whole notion is something I call a shift left strategy. This shift left strategy really means that what we're doing is we're putting a lot more skills and knowledge to the first level of what we're doing, being the frontline support, the front office, setting up service level agreements, determining service catalog, uh, becoming maybe sales ex uh, sale, um, business relationship experts, enabling knowledge management, have maybe automation engineers, and many of those folks play multiple roles. They play the role of a support individual, but also have the responsibility for continuous improvement of the processes so that much fewer requests are going into the level two, and then even much less of requests are going into level three, because the number of resources level two and level three are even smaller and are actually much higher in terms of what they cost and those folks should be doing project work. Those folks should be doing innovation. And this again relates back to the move. The more we shift left and the more we start automating things to the left-hand side, the much more possibility do we have and leverage our budget much more innovative. Our moves will actually go down because we don't do as much of maintenance and ongoing systems, we are actually starting to implement projects and programs. Number six is one of my favorite topics, which I spend a lot of time 
on with my clients. It is the need for process maturity. Now many organizations are starting to think about what does that mean uh, when we talk about process maturity. And let me spend a few minutes on that because this is quite important. Um, IT organizations, no matter again, medium, small to medium, mid-sized or large, many of them are actually implementing uh, process maturity assessments across their organization, looking and understanding where they are from a maturity perspective. This maturity perspective ranges typically across multiple different kinds of processes. The typical processes, we have a tech radar, which we did inside Forrester. We have done it around 19 processes. Now, these processes range from incident management to uh, event management, change management, problem management, configuration management, release management, asset management, all those kinds of things. And interestingly, what we're finding is that much of the maturity is in the typical processes such as incident management. We're finding on a scale of zero to five, which is typically the scale of how we measure process maturity, that many organizations are on an incident management at around a level 2.5 or 3. Around the problem management, the maturity is usually much lower. It is between 1 and 2, kind of tipping around 1.5. Much of the work I am emphasizing with my clients is to start thinking about how can you combine these multiple processes with each other. Incident and problem is a good example. When I look at incident management, many of my clients and many of clients out there, probably yourself, you have a lot of work you do on restoring incidents. In the meantime, to restore is a very important measure, and you get this to whatever percentage of your SLA it says, and you want to make sure that within two hours you have your priority one restored, within four hours you maybe your priority two. Now, many times there are multiple problems associated with a, a particular incident. Looking at these problems and resolving these problems based on multiple incidents is usually not happening. Problem management happens very, very reactively and is usually not taken care of when the incident is being restored. What I'm saying when we go back to the slide earlier, when we shift left, not just with regards to IT support, but also if we think more of the value chain, if we start thinking about what more can we do, we might want to look at the incident which occurred over and over again for the same reason and resolve that problem once and for all. When we resolve this problem once and for all, we are now able to actually allow ourselves a much better uh, maturity and have much improved maturity in incident management and a much more improved maturity around the um, notion of problem management. Now this particular slide here describes what I was just talking about. This is called inside Forrester a tech radar. And as you can see, the incident management process here, the equilibrium state, is very high uh, in terms of maturity. And let me just quickly describe the picture. On the left hand side, you see the business value add adjusted, uh, to some extent adjusted for uncertainty. So which process adds uh, value to the business. Of course, incident management is adding a lot of value to the business because usually the business has incidents. On the bottom line, um, you see the ecosystem phase. We have uh, five of them which we break into the creation, the survival, the growth, the equilibrium, and the decline. And then in each of those, um, there are colors where you see the process areas with minimal success, moderate success, and significant success. And the way we resolve, or the way we created the study, is we actually talked to a variety of I.O. professionals across the world, again in large and small organizations, and thought leaders, particularly in vendors, where we asked them where they thought the particular process would lie with regard to its maturity. The two I want to point out, which I think are the ones which really are important right now, are number one, change management process. We are seeing, as you can see it here in the growth phase, change management process is one of those processes which is starting to 
uh, become much more important as organizations are realizing that when somebody is doing something somewhere else, may, maybe for example, we're fat fingering a router, and I apologize for saying it that way, but I used to be in IT myself doing a lot of things which I wouldn't do anymore today, where I made a change to something. Maybe I re-indexed a database table, or I potentially switched some server. All those changes, if they're not done in conjunction with having somebody else know about it, it causes a downstream of problems. Um, so we're seeing many, many clients starting to adopt change management in a much more rigorous fashion. The other one I want to point out is knowledge management. Truly enabling knowledge from the left-hand side to the right-hand side. Uh, and from the right-hand side to the left-hand side. What I mean by that, again, is level three who potentially might be subject matter experts, but part of their time is also to actually support uh, incidents and challenges in the environment. Um, if they are able to give level two or even the service desk or the help desk some instructions out on how to troubleshoot some simple things, um, it might be just saving some time. Now, of course, there is security challenges, there is access challenges, um, which need to be resolved, but from a, from a conceptual perspective, having knowledge management across this value chain helps a lot more in terms of making transitions to a much more optimized space. Service regress management also very, very much in survival rate or in the survival stage right now, we're seeing organizations who are, again, trying to put in service catalogs which allow them to enable self-service and service requests. One example I uh, just recently had, a very uh, a mid-sized organization here in the U.S. is starting to, re had started to recognize that they had a lot of requests for software. In respect to the software request, they also had some challenges with regard to licenses because they actually were just audited by Microsoft and found out that they were under provision on some of the licenses. Now this caused them to have some exposure of risk and of course it, uh, it is forcing them to modify their processes. So what the IT organization did, they started to implement a service catalog of a most used software um, components, be it the Microsoft Exchange platform or Adobe, and with that, they had underneath that, they had of course a library of software licenses, uh, the software license pool, and people in the company, be it people who were doing process modeling with uh, maybe some of the uh, Microsoft tools, people who were doing uh, other things, could request their license automatically it was routed to somebody who in some cases needed to confirm that or in some cases it just went straight through to actually get that license provision and with it they also could keep track of the license. If the license pool was exceeded then they needed to either do something or they needed to free up some licenses which were not necessarily in use any longer. Which ties back to the desktop team because the desktop team had a good understanding of who and what uh, was used. At the same time, they also updated and modified their processes with regard to how to free up licenses when people are leaving laptops or leaving the company, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So what, what the challenge there is, to some extent, focus on these processes in such a way that they are manageable across maybe a potential two or three but they relate around a particular pain point of making things much more efficient and optimizing. Onboarding of an employee, for example, a process which is today in many organizations still very, very difficult. But if you onboard an employee, starting to think about how you put that into a service catalog, optimizing all the necessary processes around it, you could potentially be uh, in a much greater shape and you have reduced the mood in many of the maintenance and ongoing work as you might have implemented a knowledge management phase and how to do certain things. Maybe you have uh, already provisioned and connected the setup of a laptop, the identity security card, a password, um, maybe you have a single sign-on strategy which then allows you to set 
single sign-up for a variety of applications, such as Google Mail or Microsoft Exchange or other applications. And these are the trends we see with our customers right now of really trying to move themselves uh, to that maturity of equilibrium in some of those processes which are very, very key for optimization. Now, having said that, um, again, I wanted to make sure that I share with you some of the inquiry details I get with regards to IT processing all the improvements. So here, um, you can see when I asked for ITIL and CMMI um, with regards to their improvements in quality and both in process and quality, um, you can see about about five to ten percent um, was increasing their processes and quality improvements and their work around it. Um, IT process uh, in terms of leveraging ITIL and CMMI about the same usage of it, about 40 to 50 percent. Um, in the, there's still some people who say we don't know, we don't use IT processes such as incident problem change config, be it you call it ITIL processes or maybe you have adopted them, these lightweight ITIL. Um, and then there are um, a, a few who are saying that their process and their quality improvements has, have decreased, um, but only a very small percentage. But overall, again, in the middle of the picture, you want to focus on many, many organizations have said that they're focused on IT process and quality improvement with the ITIL um, and much of their work is benefiting many of their programs and processes. Now I want to share with you something we're doing right now at Forrester and if you are a Forrester customer you might have access to that. If you are not then just feel free to reach out to me again or to Ken at some point in the future. We're currently doing an interesting study with the IT Service Management Foundation in the U.S. where we're starting to recheck on who has leveraged um, service management and automation uh, processes or ITIL in the organization and what benefits have they gained. Um, we've done the same study last year. From last year, I do have those features available, but those are last year's data. We're doing the same research again for this year's data and that conference is coming up in September, so we're currently doing all the questions and have the findings hopefully in the early part of August um, or later part of August in September. And if you'd like to see those details, feel free to um, reach out to me at Ken. Um, my email is at the end of this. You can certainly send me an email. If you're for a customer, you already have that access anyway. Now, I did speak about automation, and I wanted to spend some time on that topic. Now, before we go into automation, a couple of things which are important to recognize. Automation can be scary, um, and, I, and I go back to, you might laugh or roll your eyes or shake your head, but you might have noticed my accent. I'm actually from Germany, and my grandfather had a very large farm in Germany in the southern part. Um, at that time, when he had that farm, First World War, Second World War, um, a lot of work was done manually. I still hear my mom saying to me, oh, we had to go out to the field and do all kinds of things, pull the weeds and seeds and all those things. Well, my uncle, who is the son of my grandfather, has taken over the business of my grandfather. And he has actually no longer his sons go out and pull the weeds or do anything, they actually have automated. They have automated their much of their work to use machines and tools to go and do away with all of that or much of that manual labor. Now, that was a good thing because it wasn't a lot of fun to be out there and pulling weeds in a 90 degree heat and 90% humidity. So uh, the good thing of automation is that Automation allows us to get rid of those mundane tasks we do. However, maybe some things need to be done so that people might not do that job anymore. So that's, that's I think, the challenge with automation. When we think automation and when automation is brought in, yes, some people might not need to do those things anymore. But these people can be shifted to other places. And again, there is a shift in people 
helping to reduce the mood as well. When we start shifting resources to much more sensitive, uh, much more business value added functions, we're actually adding more value and innovation than keeping the mood going. And that's really important for us to recognize. So automation isn't and shouldn't be a scary thing. Automation actually can help us. Um, and I do think, I believe, if you embrace automation, you are much better off because if you are fighting it, you might just be automated away. Your skill might not be up to date anymore. And you might just lose out. Again, my grandfather no longer lives, but my uncle has embraced automation. He's very successful, and his son are doing the same thing. He could have, of course, said, I am not doing that, and I'm still leveraging people, but he can't compete with the prices, and he had to automate in such a way. So that's important uh, to say before I go further into the automation detail. Now, automation, we have inside Forcer, we call it the automation wheel. It actually goes to my colleague, Glenn O'Donnell's credit, it's all his research work. Um, he has come up with three different types of automation, um, which can be and, and should be looked at differently. The first one is a task execution automation. And as many of you are probably familiar with maybe uh, job scheduling, those job schedules, and I used to be in the HP 3000 world doing job control language on the HP 3000 platform. I know that dates me a little bit, but back then we had JCL job schedules, which automated a series of tasks on that platform. That is automation already. Many other examples are out there which are task execution automation. Um, for example, a self-service of automating a request uh, or selecting a question and have some knowledge with regard to a knowledge base is also a task execution and a task automation. The question we ask here is how, or the question we, we, we look for tasks, when, we, when you look for automation of tasks, you want to ask how, how are we doing that? The second step of process automation then is the process flow, where we say that we connect multiple steps of a process, meaning the connection of incident and knowledge management, or the connection of event management and potential uh, self-service requesting, um, or an event management and a, and a healing of a system. Maybe we have set ourselves a baseline of a particular performance issue on a server. Once that baseline has been hit, Maybe we are at, I don't know, 75% of capacity. We might want to automatically provision as an additional server or additional virtual machine. Much of that can be done today based on potentially the request of a, if we can combine the two, the task execution and the process flow or process automation. Maybe based on a request from a developer of a virtual machine, we automate that request into an automatic provisioning of a virtual machine to that individual, once the individual does no longer use it, we also automate the release of the virtual machine back to the pool, um, and there, therefore we don't have all these endless virtual machines sitting around. These are just some examples. Same example earlier I mentioned with the license, where we potentially request a license, and there's a task execution that a Adobe license or a Visio license is going to you for your usage, uh, for a specific time. The last part of uh, automation are decision triggers. And I think that's the one where we need to be the much, we need to make sure we spend a lot of time to think about. And I think this is the one where we need to be careful about what we do. Because decision triggers are the things where we have to ask the why questions. And those type of automations, I think it's the one where we fear, we have the most fear. Um, if, if you have, you know, seen some of, some of the movies, the artificial intelligence movies, or some of the sci-fi's out there of the robots and things, um, I'm not sure if we're going to get to the point where everything is going to be driven by some robot, but hopefully not. Decision triggers help us to make wide decisions. Maybe within a particular 
a group of an application or a particular use case around a particular group of things. But I'm sure you could think of some areas where you think, why do I need to say yes to this? Because it's really, I don't really need to be involved in that. Sometimes when we do changes, um, it is important that we recognize the different kind of angles. So decision triggers, I think, are the ones which are the last part of automation, which require much more care, much more thinking, much more understanding about the impact, where task execution and process flow are actually relatively simple um, and in some cases can be easily automated or easily implemented. Now, with the tools available, more and more we see that the tools from vendors are starting to cross into multiple areas, meaning the tools are starting to become end-to-end. Uh, -end. When we have a performance issue, we start making sure that uh, events trigger performance issues, performance issues think about service tests, some automated automation is being done, almost hinting towards intelligence, um, which is good, absolutely good, because it takes away the normal work we do, and again, we can start focusing on the things which are important. And that really starts hitting uh, and hinting on and, and looking a lot like a good optimiz optimization and allows you to optimize where you are and what you do today. Now, this slide here is a little bit complicated. Don't worry about it. But it just shows some use cases of what I was just talking about. So for example, a service center manager on the left-hand side is a call center, um, the service desk tool, maybe Maybe this call center escalation to tier two support can be automated through some kind of a task. Um, there's task uh, uh, automation. Maybe the service desk handing over control to somebody in the automation area or some automation uh, team who starts automating some activity uh, with regards to what needs to be done based on a performance issue or based on an incident. Um, same on the right-hand side, when we look at the command center, maybe the command center, the escalation up into a tier three, a Microsoft expert, a Linux expert, a whatever expert, maybe some of that can be automated. So this is just a, a, a picture to show you what's possible. Um, what you want to do is you want to really look at the low-hanging fruit and start working there in, in optimizing those. Now, one more point of the slide, very important, is that we do see a great deal of combination of the service center, meaning the call center or the service desk or help desk, if you call it, maybe, and the command center, that's the, the operation center and the automation center. We see in many clients, large or small, that they're starting to bring these groups together to optimize how they do their work, because they're recognizing they don't have enough resources to do all those things, so why not find some synergy in the middle somewhere? Um, in in some, some areas, it's, the middle is around the tool. In some areas, the middle is around certain control points. In some, it's around escalation. You have to figure that out for yourself. Unfortunately, there is not one way of doing that because it depends on your maturity and the maturity of the tech radar. And if you do your maturity assessment, you might know where potentially you be, uh, where you should be starting to optimize some of those things. All right. Last but not least is something important, the business model and the business model flexibility. Now, we haven't said the word cloud yet, and there is no presentation without the word cloud. But I wanted to boil this down into something which makes sense to all of us. Now, there's multiple ways of thinking in terms of cloud. There's, a, there's the infrastructure as a cloud, there's the process as a cloud, there's the all kinds of different things. Business process as a cloud, um, and there's the software as a service, or the cloud for where you get a variety of IT management uh, tools. And we do see that the software as a service, be it a service desk or the command center or performance management tools, are the highest growing, and there's many others, uh, but as I'm in IT management, I'm touching on those. There's many, many others, but we see the staff is the highest one in growing software as a service, and we think that by the end of 2012, which is soon, 
uh, that about 60% of uh, organizations and companies will be using software as a service. Now, what, what and why are these companies doing that? Um, I have to think back when we went down the path of an application service provider, very similarly where we leverage somebody outside to manage our application. Very similar model with a variety of different uh, things to, to, to consider. I'm not saying ASP and SAS is the same. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to overall lower our cost of doing business while we're improving the business agility of it. And many of my, many of my customers are saying, why do I want to go to a 12-month evaluation of an IT management tool? Why do I want to staff that with two people maintaining it and updating it and every three months or every six months, or not even updating it because I don't have the resources? Why don't I just give that to somebody else? And why don't I just use the tool? What a great solution. And that's really why many organizations are saying that. We want to lower our cost because at $40 a seat or at $60 a seat or whatever it is per year with a two-year contract or a three-year contract, it comes down to a much better value proposition as I can see much faster in leveraging the tool uh, than actually implementing the tool. And that's really the bottom line. Many vendors have done a lot of good work around security and risk, good pricing models are out there. Certainly you should look into that. But that's really another way of optimizing IT today with regard to leveraging the SaaS. Now if you are curious about adoption models, SaaS and the cloud as a service with regard to the mid-market and the enterprise, here again um, you can see the, dif the difference between um, the, the mid-market and the enterprise about the same adoption and increasing 5 to 10 percent um, in, in, the, in the coming year. This is Q4 of 2011, so this, was for, this will be for the next year, which is 2012. Um, a little bit more of a deep dive. We're almost done. Um, thank you so much for hanging in there. A couple more things I want to make. I talked about people. We talked about process. We, talked, we haven't talked a lot about tools and technology. Um, many times my customers are asking me, so what, how should I select a tool? How, should I, how do I know which one is the right one? Of course, we have our uh, Waves, um, Force the Waves, where you can look at uh, the different types of tools. Um, but when I usually w what I say is start figuring out what do you want to do? Do you want to think about integrated solutions, or do you want to look at best of breed? Um, we asked this question. So in Q4, we asked, what is your strategy regarding integrated solutions compared to best of three? And interestingly, we see a, a one scary thing, I see that increase, that many organizations don't have a strategy. They don't have a strategy with regards to buying best of three or integrated solutions. Most organizations are starting to prefer best of three. You can see here, 32% say, we want to buy best of three, and then, um, 15% say they're purchasing integrated solutions. Now, this is starting to change. Because of the work you have to do on integration, um, the, the type of integration and the type of work many times takes a significant effort by the organization. And that's something to think about when you go out into in looking for tools, how much tool integration do I have to do versus how much if I buy best of trade or if I buy purchase integrated solutions, is already done because the, and ask the tool vendor for proof points of that. That's important as well because much of that can look good on the slide, but if you dig down deeper into the solution, um, you might not find that integration um, inside the solution. So look for evidence. I think it's a very important point to remember when you look at tools. Now, when you select tools, we ask also. What is the importance of criteria when selecting vendors or even partners? Um, five being very important. Um, so here you can see that many organizations are saying, we want to make sure that we have uh, you know, very good, simple, manageable, we have convenience, tangible support, um, relationships, development, customer services, vertical experience, and vendor brand. Um, so interestingly, simple, manageable, speed of implementation, technical support, and convenience 
are much, much, much more important than the kind of vendor brand or vertical experience. Of course, everybody is looking at the price, and I, you know, that's something nobody can argue with. No matter what you buy, you're price sensitive. Um, no matter if you are small or large, you're sourcing a vendor manager management, management team or your, your, your buyer team or whoever is price sensitive. But also understand how good does the vendor support you, how speedy are they in their implementation, and how simple it is to work with them and to manage tools. Because it doesn't matter if I give my husband the kitchen and I tell him it's dinner tonight and I hope my husband is not on the call, and can you don't tell him, I will be guaranteed that he will not be able to put a dinner together. So manageability of the kitchen is not a, it's not the issue. Um, he just doesn't know how to do it. And so that's many times the challenge. You don't have the right tool and they don't if they're, they're not usable, not manageable, not simple, then um, it's it's not really adding value and you're not able to optimize. Now, I think we have another uh, question, another poll. We have got a couple minutes left here. Um, I wanted to understand, where does your IT op operations group lie with regards to your pain scale? Is your pain scale between mm, kind of between zero and three, like no pain, low pain? Are you feeling very much pain between three and five, like mid-pain to moderate pain? Or is your pain between five and eight, severe pain? Um, or in your organization, are you in excruciating pain to the point that you don't want to go into the office, that you are ma either your management or your individual contributor? I really, both Ken and I are very curious about where your pain scale lies. So Ken, if you can turn on the poll, that'd be great. Uh, yeah, yeah, thanks, Evelyn. So uh, what I would like to do is, in fact, I, I, I didn't set up a poll for this, and what I would prefer is if uh, the folks who are still on the call is to uh, Basically, send a chat answer to to all of us in terms of how you see where your pain level is at, and uh, you know we would appreciate that. Again, apologies for not sending a poll in advance on that one, but um, that might save us some time as well. So, all right, thanks. That's a great idea, Ken. Great idea. So while you do that, while you think of your pain level, I wanted to follow up and give you with some conclusions. What does it mean to optimize IT operations? I think it is pretty simple but also pretty sophisticated. First thing you have to assess where you are. You have to know where you are from your maturity. How mature are you? And if you need to look end to end of, of across all the processes, use the tech radar um, or use ITIL as a baseline. If you are in a particular area, the service desk, in the command center, in the technical support, maybe just look at that. If you're a problem manager, look at that. And then design for yourself where you want to go. Where do you want to be? Do you, if you are in a one today, to make it to a five is very difficult. Maybe you want to place yourself at a three, and that's why I was asking the pain level. Um, then, when you know where your pain is, and when you know where you want to go to get out of that pain to the next lowest pain level, develop a strategy to go there. What is that strategy around the people, process, and technology? And you can't do just one. You have to think of it in those three things. You have to look at your skills and people. You have to look at your processes in detail. And you have to look at what technology you have. And then implement these changes. Implement them, but also you need to make sure you have measurements. But measurements need to be there before and after. If you do your strategy, make sure that you label the current measurements and metrics of what you and where you are. So for example, if your first call resolution is today 65% with a customer satisfaction of two, and you want to go to a 75% with a customer satisfaction of four, make sure you measure the before and type and, and know your goal of where you want to go so that when you get to, the, to a point, you only know the delta because you have measured your point in time from your starting point. Many customers don't do that and they go somewhere and they don't know where they have been and because of that they don't recognize and see the delta and because of that they can't prove that they, that they have made a difference and the funding runs out and they have to go back to what they used to do. So measure and take action on findings and when you're done, go back and assess more and decide on the next step. Um, it's not helpful to actually boil 
the ocean. It, it's not helpful to solve world hunger. We really need to start focusing on, when we optimize, we need to know what to optimize, in what area to optimize, measure, and then put a plan together. And as a follow-up, here's my email. Actually, there's a typo in it, so I apologize. It's e Ehrlich, no L up there, I just record the at, uh, at forest.com. Send me an email if you have additional questions, if you want some of the research I mentioned, um, or if you want to share with me your pain, even if you're not a Forrester customer, uh, eearlish e at forrester.com, or you can also send it to E. Hoppert, which is my former name, um, will work as well. Um, and if you have any questions now, as we are still have a few more minutes, let us know. Great. Thank you so much, Evelyn. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, I want to thank everybody for uh, joining us on this uh, webinar. And uh, we, uh, along with Evelyn, look forward to hearing from you in terms of any questions or follow-up discussions you may want to have uh, with uh, Evelyn or with uh, Suma Software. Again, thank you very much. And thank you very much, Evelyn. And uh, have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you.